Check, check, check. Rock Point YA, how we doing tonight? Yo, this, this, this building feels fun tonight. I'm excited to be here. You guys excited to be here? Y'all excited? How many, how many of y'all drove an hour, over an hour to be here? Come on, y'all. How many of you guys drove over two hours? No one. None of y'all care that much. Okay, cool. Um, hey, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here tonight with you guys. I'm excited to dive into God's word. Um, for those of you that have no idea who I am, my name is Clayton York, and I have the privilege and honor um, of, of leading this young adults ministry that you guys are all in and a part of right now. So with that being said, before we get started, I just want you to do something, okay? I want you to look to the person next to you and say, I feel good. Now look to the person on the other side of you and say, I knew that I would. <laughs> Why well, You looked at me both times. <laughs> I like that. I, well, I looked at you both times too. Hey, um, tonight we are, we are ending our Make Room series that I've just had a blast um, being in over the past couple of weeks. Um, you guys ready to have some fun tonight? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah? Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to have some fun, because if you're not, just leave. Just leave now, okay? Just don't sit down. Sit down, sit down. You're ready to have some. Okay, cool, cool, cool. How many people in here right now, how many people in here right now just have that squad of homies that you roll with all the time? Yeah? How many of you brought them with you tonight? Any, any homies in this room tonight? <laughs> y'all don't want to admit who you sit next to, huh? Okay. We all, got, we all got that group of friends, that squad of homies that we do life with, that we spend a ton of time with. Um, that, was a, that was a group for me in, in high school. And now, as I was, as I was thinking about um, what to say next, I've got to choose my words carefully, right? Because if you've been around Rock Point Young Adults for any certain amount of time, you understand one thing about me, and it's I say things I shouldn't sometimes. Um, and so I had to think about this. And so I'm going to give you the option. I, uh, I want to tell you a story about me and some of my friends in high school. You know, this is driving me nuts, which is why I keep scooting it over. Um, me, and, me and some of my friends in high school. And so I will give you the option of hearing about the time that we went looking for a fight. And so it's, that's A. That's this is also known as A, okay? One is A. Or two, I told this story before, but I don't know who in here has heard it, um, the time that I got kicked out of Jamaica. Which one do you want? A or B? One or two? One. Okay. One it is. One it is. One it is. If you, are, if you have no idea um, and you want to hear the story of Jamaica, come find me later. I'd love to tell you. So me and my squad of friends, me and my homies, y'all, these were the people that I did life with. I was reckless. I was reckless when I was in high school. Y'all, it was like... Me and, my, me and my boys, a group of about seven, eight of us, we did the dumbest, the dumbest things. This was pre-BC, this was before Christ, before BCC, before Clayton's Christ. I, I did dumb things, okay? Um, y'all, we went. Don't judge me. None of y'all can judge me. There were, um, there were 30 of us one time that decided to go streaking. Okay, yep, weird, I know. Just we'll leave that at that. That's that. that. Um, we used to go catch geese. Y'all, we would go catch geese. With yeah, we would go catch geese with pillowcases, y'all. We we did a senior prank one time. We went to our Spanish teacher's room in the middle of the night. We broke into the school. Okay, that's bad right there. Um, we took out all the chairs, all the tables, brought in about 15, 16 bags of mulch, covered her whole room in mulch, brought some baby pools in, and let some geese just roam around in their paradise. So she came to school the next morning. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. Um, and so uh, me and this group of friends, y'all. There was this one time where. I had a friend, his name was Michael Glotzbach, and this dude was just bowed out of his mind in high school. And he was like, hey, let's go, hey, let's go look, let's go look for some fights. I was like, yeah, let's go, yeah, let's just go fight people because it's fun, right? And so we, uh, we proceeded to get into a car, a bunch of us, and we went to this, like, outdoor mall area where um, we were just walking around, you know, like stupid high school kids, like, oh, you small, man, oh, fight me. And people, of course, don't just want to fight because that's stupid. And so... <laughs> My friend Michael saw this guy walking out of a Hollister, and um, at this point in time, guys with long hair was kind of a no-no thing. Um, clearly, that doesn't matter anymore. And so, saw this guy walking out of Hollister. He had long hair, short, stubby little dude. And my friend Michael goes up to him and says, "Oh, so I heard you want to fight, bro." This guy's like, "What?" <laughs> so all of us are like standing behind him. We're looking at each other like, "Yeah, man, I heard you. Want yeah, we heard you want to fight, bro. I heard you want to pick a fight with us." And this guy's like, I don't, I don't know if you want to do that. 
And we're like, bro, have you seen yourself? <laughs> There's seven of us and one of you. Of course we want to do that. And so um, this guy goes, all right, cool. And he literally sits down on the ground. His shoes were untied. He proceeded to tie his shoes as if he knew what was about to happen. So I'm looking at my boys like, hey, we got this, right? This boy's about to get hit on the ground. Two hits. Him hitting the floor and us hitting him while he's on the floor. It's what's going to happen. My friend Michael goes up to him. This, this dude's ready. He like, y'all, he squares up in a way that I've never seen anyone square up before. Almost as if to say, like, this dude knew what he was doing, okay? And my friend Michael just starts talking at him. And, y'all, I'm not kidding you. This boy out of nowhere just starts dropping my friend's left and right. And I'm, I'm, like, I'm, see- I'm like seeing my friends get beat up. And I'm standing there like, what do I do? Because <laughs> I didn't want to get hit. I, y'all, I bounced. I jetted. I was out of there. I ran back to the car and left my friends literally just laying there on the ground. Um, worst thing in the entire world. I go back and, you know, a while later, and they're just bleeding out of their mouths. And they're like, bro, where were you? I was like, I, had to, I don't know how to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I <I'd, laughs> <I'd> believe. <laughs> Y'all, we, I left. I left my boys. I left my squad. I left my homies there by themselves. They were isolated. They were alone. They were scared. They were nervous. And I was gone. And as I'm, as I'm thinking about that, I wonder if that's how a lot of us feel when it comes to community with each other. I bet a lot of us feel isolated. I bet a lot of people in here feel alone or distracted. I bet a lot of people feel left out of community. Deep, and I'm not talking shallow, surface-level community. I'm talking deep-rooted, I'm going to fight for you at all costs type of community. And so as we end this series, Make Room, this series is one of my favorite series out of the entire year because it's, it's an opportunity for us to literally make room for God to move, for, for us to play the background and give God the forefront of everything. So as we end, I want to talk about making room for community. I was talking with a group of guys literally as they walked in, and they were talking about how they're getting a small group started. And I'm like, man, that's, like, that's, that's the route we're going tonight. It's incredible how God lines things up. And so I have a big idea for you. Um, the big idea is just something that we do if you're not used to it that kind of sums up everything that you're going to hear tonight. Um, and so the big idea for you is simply this. Community matters. Community matters. Community matters. So I want you guys to follow along with me in the Bible. Um, if you've got your tangible Bibles, awesome. Open them up to Galatians 6. If you've got your phone, actually do me a favor. If you've got your phone with you, hold it high in the air. Come on, everybody. Hold it high in the air. Get your phone. Hold it high in the air. Every single person. If you don't have a phone, you need to go talk to your parents because they messed you up. Hold up. Hold up your phones. Hold up your phones. Okay, keep them in the air. Keep them in the air. Keep them in the air. Cool. Some of y'all got your flashlights on as if I'm doing like a concert. I'm not about to sing for y'all. Listen, if you've got your iPhone, if you've got your iPhone, proceed to bring it down to, to your stomach area and open up the Bible app. If you still got your phones in the air and you have an Android, do me a favor. On the count of three, I just want you to throw it on the ground as hard as you possibly can. All right? Thank you. Come back next week. That's all I got. <laughs> let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Y'all, one thing that you'll understand about me is I like to have fun. Um, I think a lot of times um, people get in, in places like this where we're surrounded by, you know, other young adults or in churches or conferences, and it's just serious all the time. I think God is very intentional with his word, and there's a lot of fun that we can, that we can take from it and a lot of things that we can um, gain from this um, and having fun and also being serious. So pray with me, God. We trust you in this place tonight, God. Would you do what only you can do? Lord, I pray that as we dive into scripture, as we dive into this book of Galatians, God, that we would understand what real community looks like and how much it actually does matter. Lord, we love you. We trust you. Would one person, would one person in this place get to know you closer and better? Would one person in this place get to know you for the first time tonight? Well, that's what I want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, Galatians 6, 1 through 5 says this. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on to the right path. Y'all, this isn't that type of judging relationship. This isn't the like, hey, man, you're in the wrong, like, forget you, bro, get your life back on. No, this is like the, I'm going to, I love you. I want to see you through this. I'm going to help you. I'm here for you type of relationship Paul's talking about. It says, be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, ooh, boy, you're only fooling yourself. 
you're not that important. Y'all, Paul literally says, you're not that important. He goes on to say, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Someone needs to hear that tonight. Stop comparing yourself to everybody around you. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Now, we also find a super incredible illustration of community in Psalm 133. And I want to read that for you. It says this. I love it. I love how scripture just bleeds the heart of God. Listen, it says, how wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, life everlasting. Community is something that you and I long for. It was literally put in our DNA from day one. We all want community. We want to be plugged in. We want to be connected. We were never meant to live life alone, but community is oftentimes one of the hardest things to achieve. Yet, even when we do achieve it, even when we do get deep-rooted community, it's really hard to hold on to. A lot of times it's really hard to hold on to. Why is that? You say, why is that, Clayton? Why is it hard to hold on to? Here's why. Because community is done with people. And people, people are messy. Y'all are messy. You got messy, messed up lives. Look to the person next to you and say, you are messy. Everyone look at me and say, you are messy. David, shut up, bro. <laughs> people, y'all, people, people are messy. People are messy. I want to share with you my definition of community. You're not going to find this in Webster's Dictionary. You will find this in my notes on my iPhone if you ever get a hold of it. But you won't. Here's what I think community is. <laughs> Some of you are like, but I know your password. Can anyone guess my password? Nope. Y'all are terrible at guessing. Nope. Zero, 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 zero. I literally just gave you my password. Forget that. Okay, here we go. My definition of community is simply this. Community takes imperfect Messy people connected with each other who will never agree on everything but try hard to build each other up without knocking each other out, right? That's what real community is. Why? And why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? The biggest reason community is so hard, young adult families, is because the enemy is at war with it. He don't want you to have it. The enemy does not want you to have community. Y'all realize the first thing that he did on earth was try and separate a good thing that God had brought together. Ooh, and boy, was it a good thing. The enemy wanted to try and separate what God had joined together with Adam and Eve. They were to live in harmony. They were to love each other. It was to be perfect and blameless, y'all, in the Garden of Eden. It was good, and I'm talking real good. Adam looked at Eve and said, ooh, girl, it's good. <laughs> it is good. In, f in fact, Adam wrote, um, he wrote a poem. He wrote a poem for Eve. I want to read it to you. Adam, Adam was in love, in love with Eve. They were to build community and relationship so much so that Adam says this. In Genesis 2.23, he writes, Oh, Eve, bone of my bone, scandalous, <laughs> and flesh of my flesh. He said, girl, you came from me and we are one. Adam loved her. That's community. Satan saw that and wanted to break apart what God had joined together. So what he did was he took the truth of God. He took God's truth and twisted it just enough. Twisted just a couple words to make them believe that a good thing was actually bad. The enemy wants to separate us. The things we believe, we run after. The things that you and I believe, we run after. And if Satan can make you believe a lie then you will stay away from the truth. I want to do something with you guys real quick. Um, I want to do an, uh, 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 a, a group effort thing, okay? So here's what we're going to do. On the count of three, I want you to close your eyes and do not peek, all right? If you peek, you're going to have to come sit right up here like you're in timeout, all right? Don't peek. One, two, three. Close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Y'all are children. Quit peeking. Okay. When I say open your eyes, 
Um, production booth. Yeah. When I say open your eyes, I want you to yell out what colors you see on the screen. Okay? That's what you're going to do. One, two, three. <laughs> Ethan said, I'm out of here. <laughs> Y'all are like, ah, oh, this again? He got us. Okay, just out of curiosity, just out of, cu just out of curiosity, who, okay, 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 okay. Just out of curiosity, who saw white and gold? Okay, okay. Who saw black and blue? Okay. I literally sent this, I sent this picture to our production booth earlier, and I saw white and gold. I'm not going to lie, but now I see black and blue. Um, I want to I wanted, I wanted share with you something. There's a reason that I had you do this, okay? Listen, 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 listen. I did some research, okay? I do that every once in a while. I did some research. Um, and I read this. I read this. People do see both colors, white, gold, black, blue. It says this, the dress is actually blue and black, though most people saw it as white and gold, at least at first. They go on to say, my research showed that if you assumed the dress was in a shadow, you were much more likely to see it as white and gold. Why? Because shadows overrepresent light. And that's how the enemy works. He confuses your mind just enough to make God's truth overshadowed by just a few things. To make you believe something that actually isn't there. Like this. Here's how the enemy works. Community? We think about community. Oh, yeah, community. Man, community. Community is done with people. And people? Ah, people are messy. If I get into a small group or build community, they're going to have to know who I am. I don't want people knowing who I am. I got a past. People are going to make fun of my past. Yeah, I got to leave that alone. I got to stay as far away from community as I possibly can. Yeah, community? I don't need community. Community is bad. That's how the enemy works is he makes you believe that you don't actually need it, that it's not good for you. <sighs> the enemy is at war with community. The enemy is at war with community. And the way he goes to war is exactly what he did with Adam and Eve. He takes truth, twists it, and makes us believe a lie. Just take notes, write this down. The enemy will always present a false enemy to distract you from fighting himself. The enemy will always present a false enemy to distract you from fighting himself. And to him, the best way to make that happen is to get you to give up on community. To get you to give up on community. Y'all, if it's hot in here, I'm sorry. Part of our AC is broken. But hey, we're in this together. Remember, we're messy. We're messy people. Someone next to you starts smelling, do me a favor and just raise your hand so I can call them out. <laughs> Don't do that. So here's what I want to do. I want to take two different lies. Here's what I want to do. I want to take two different lies that we believe about community. That the enemy makes us believe about community. So if you're a note taker, write this down. If you're not a note taker, freaking start tonight, okay? Cool. Got a lot of energy, y'all. Fired up. Lie number one is this. Lie number one is this. I'm fine on my own. I'm fine on my own. I'm fine on my own. That's lie number one. No, you aren't. You aren't fine on your own. Let me tell you something. You and I will always follow something. You and I will always follow. We were, we were created. We were designed to follow something. But so many of us follow things that lead us in directions we were never intended to go and wonder why we feel so isolated and alone. And it's because we have followed the things that the world tells us to follow. We've been disciplined and discipled by the culture of this world. Do y'all know that world culture and kingdom culture are two vastly different things? Here's what I mean by that. The world says, don't invest in the biblical community with each other. Don't get invested in the community that actually matters where people will help you grow. It's fake. It's dishonest. They'll lie to you. They'll always let you down. That's what the world tells you. You know what kingdom culture tells you? Kingdom says how wonderful and pleasant it is when people live together in unity. The world says you're fine on your own. You don't need people in your life. You don't need them. 
The lie is that you don't need people. The lie is that I don't, I don't need anybody in this room. But the Bible paints a totally different picture for you and I. Y'all understand the Bible is so full of story after story, person after person involved in deep-rooted community that shows the love of Christ. Deep-rooted community with friends and family that are formed within the family of God. Jesus even said that there is no greater love than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. Y'all, that's community. People that you would die for. People that you would go to war next to. Um, that's community. If you just read the, the things that Paul wrote, if you read anything that Paul wrote, he literally shouts out, he, he's, he's the biggest shout out dude of all time. Every single letter that he starts with, he's like, hey, to my friends, to my boys, to my homies, hey, I miss you guys. I love you. I'm going to see you soon. I'm sending someone to you. I can't wait till we're united again. Y'all have that one friend? Does anybody have that one friend that, like, is just on top of the world all the time? That's just, like, happy all the time. They're like, hey, at top of the world, I just lost everything in my life, but praise God, I'm good, and it's I'm happy to be alive, right? You're like, would you just freaking cry for once in your life? <laughs> That's Paul. Paul is that guy. Paul is so high on life and high on community because he knows the value of what it actually is. Paul knew the, how important the body of Christ was. He knew what his job was. And he would stop at nothing to share the gospel and do life with people. Galatians 6, 4 through 6, listen to what he says. Pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. And you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Paul knew what his job was, y'all. And he was good at it. I'm going to share the love of Christ, and I'm going to do it with people. He goes on to say, those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. I'm going to tell you something. You cannot read scripture and come to the conclusion that you're fine on your own and don't need people. You just can't do it. If you find that anywhere in scripture, let me know. Because this stumped me. In John 17, Jesus prayed that we would be one in unity. Everyone say unity. One in unity. The Bible's full of this. Culture will tell you that you're fine and you don't need people. The lie, that lie is primarily coming from two different places, y'all. You're fine on your own comes from two different places. And number one, it's this. And this is a lot of people in this room. It's just flat out pride. Your pride will tell you that I'm good on my own. I don't need people around. I'm, I'm going to do me. You do you. And we'll do that separately. I don't need you. That's pride. Pride will tell you to stay in your own lane and do it alone. Um, <laughs> Paul says in verse 3, if you think you're too important to help someone, hey, yo, listen to this. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. He goes on to say in verses 7 and 8, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Pride tells you that you don't need community. So the first thing is pride, and the second thing is something that a lot of us will not like to admit, but happens way too often. And it's a scary one, all right? If it's not pride, it comes from this place of protection. The most common reason we get into protection mode, we go into protection mode, is because we've been hurt by someone or something in the past. Enough to make us believe that we don't, we don't need people anymore. People have hurt me. But Clayton, like, I've, I've tried small groups, and I've tried getting connected with deep-rooted biblical people, and they've just hurt me. I've been to churches before, and I've been hurt by the church. I don't, I'm fine on my own. And so, maybe, maybe you're here tonight, and you hear me say this. You hear me tell you that community matters and that it's worth it and that it's valuable. And the only response you have is, no, it's not. It's not. Because I'm triggered and I've been hurt by people in community before. That's not coming from a place of pride or rebellion, but protection. And protection in and of itself is not a bad thing, right? 
but too much of it can be. Um, a couple of weeks ago, my wife was working with uh, our horse. She was training it, doing what horse people do, and um, <laughs> she has this rope where she like she'll let him out, and apparently, you know, thousand pound animals are supposed to run in circles around us little humans, and so. Um, I see, I'm watching her do this, and the horse starts running, and then he just gets like, he gets, he gets his own kick of something, and he just takes off, and the rope runs straight through my wife's hand, and y'all, this burn on her finger was gnarly, it was gross, and so she, uh, it was, it was disgusting, and, uh, gave her a big old burn mark, and, um, she was like, I should probably cover this up, um, my wife is so cute, y'all, <laughs> my wife is so cute, I was telling her, I was telling her about this whole, like, protection mode and stuff like that. And she goes, hey, she goes, that reminds me of my cut. <laughs> I'm like, babe, that's the cutest thing I've ever heard you say. It's like, what? She goes, that reminds me of my cut. <laughs> right? I was like, explain more. What do you mean by that? She says, she said, that's not what she sounds like. She said, uh, she says, well, um, I put a Band-Aid on my cut to, to keep it from getting infected. And y'all... Side note, we got this box of Band-Aids from the store that literally says, keep the Band-Aid on for three days, and after three days, the wound is gone. She kept it on for three days, opened it up, and the wound was bigger and nastier than it was before. Like, freaking Band-Aids are lying to us, okay? So, after three days, she opens it up, and she's like, that didn't work at all. Um, but she goes, it reminds me of my cut, how when I put a Band-Aid on it, it's protected from everything else on the outside getting in. But it stops the healing process. It slows the healing process down. She said, when I uncovered it, yes, it was vulnerable and open to everything else around it. But it healed a lot faster. And I was like, dang, you should preach. <laughs> you get up here and talk about this, y'all. If you protect something for too long, it's not a good thing. What's the first thing that we do when, when we light a, if you light a match or a candle, we always try and do what? We try and cover it, right, so the wind doesn't blow it out. But if you were to move your hand directly over the top of it, like this, it would just, it would, it would completely go out. Because too much protection will make a good thing go out. And the reason I tell you that is this. If you protect something for too long, community in general, you'll deprive yourself of what you need the most. Community matters. The enemy wants so badly for you to believe that you're fine on your own and you don't need people in your life. So, lie number one, I'm fine on my own, and lie number two is this. Community shouldn't be a struggle. Woo! Community shouldn't be a struggle. Man, Clayton, community shouldn't be a struggle. It should all be good and fun and dandy all the time, right? We believe that community should not involve a struggle at all. Galatians 6, 9 through 10 says, let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Paul says, don't grow weary of doing good. Yet even while you're doing good, we can grow tired of doing that. When, when life is doing the right thing and everything is in your favor, I can encounter seasons of weariness. You can encounter seasons of hardship. Listen, when you're down, don't grow weary of doing good. Don't give up, y'all. Don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Why? Why do we do that so much? Because we, you and I, what we do is we equate ease with good and comfortable with right. When it's not easy, it's not right. So the lie we believe with community is that it shouldn't involve struggle, and so it should just be easy all the time. So we just stay away from it. I was watching Like Mike yesterday. Anyone seen Like Mike? Bow Wow's first movie? That thing made him popular. Like Mike was watching Family Matters on a TV, um, on, on, on the TV show, and he's, he's, a, he's an orphan in this show, and he, he just wants to get adopted, and he sees Family Matters, and he sees them all jumping around their living room, having fun, and laughing, and he says, that's what I want. That's what I want, because it looked like there was no struggle involved at all. That's what we feel like community should be like all the time. If it doesn't look like that, I don't want it. Community should involve struggle. And so we see that, and then we get confused when community doesn't resolve conflict within an episode of a TV show that we watch. We want what we see on TV, and that's not the reality. So we give up 
on the very thing God gave us to hold us together, which is each other. We give up on community because it shouldn't involve struggle. Paul says, don't grow weary or tired of doing what is good. You could be doing the right thing, the good thing, and still encounter struggle. Man, but Clayton, you don't get it, bro. You don't understand. Homie, you don't get it. Like, I've joined small groups. I know the right people. I've been invested in the right crowds. I've had coffee with people that say they love me. But I'm just left out to dry all the time. People don't care about me. It's a struggle. And because it's a struggle, I'm staying as far away from it as I possibly should. I'm out of community. So we give up on people. And for some of us, the struggle is around the fact that we've been hurt in community. And we might actually have to face the facts that we got to trust people again. Y'all, that was me for the longest time of my life. But the struggle is what leads to maturity. Struggle is what leads to maturity. I want to I read something for you that's incredibly cool. And I really want you to understand what I'm about to read. I read this story um, online, and I just, I just want to read it for you. Um, just because there's struggle, y'all, doesn't mean that it's wrong. Just because there's struggle doesn't mean that God isn't in the middle of it. Just because there's struggle doesn't mean that God isn't trying to do something in your life. Listen to this. A man found a cocoon of an emperor moth. He took it home so that he could watch the moth come out of the cocoon. On the day, a small opening appeared. He sat and watched the moth for several hours as the moth struggled to force the body through that little hole. The moth seemed to be stuck and appeared to have stopped making progress. It seemed as if it had gotten as far as it could and could go no further. The man, in his kindness, decided to help with the moth. So he took a pair of scissors and snipped off the remaining bit of the cocoon. What a boss. The moth then emerged easily, but its body was swollen and small, its wings wrinkled and shriveled. The man continued to watch the moth because he expected that at any moment the wings would enlarge and expand and be able to support the body, which would contract in time. Neither happened. In fact, the little moth spent the rest of its life crawling around with a small, swollen body and shriveled wings. It was never able to fly. The man in his kindness and haste did not understand that the struggle required for the moth to get through the tiny opening was necessary to force fluid from the body of the moth into its wings so that it would be ready for flight upon achieving its freedom from the cocoon. Freedom and flight would only come after the struggle. By depriving the moth of the struggle, he deprived the moth of hell. So many of us think we know what we need to do. So many of us want to live by plan A. That man's plan A was to snip that thing's cocoon and let it, let it run free. But it needed the struggle in order to grow. <sighs> Y'all, we need a struggle. Community involves struggle. It's hard. It's painful. But it leads to maturity. Um, we want community. You and I want community. But all we want to do is offer shallow commitment. Which makes us follow the enemy's lies over God's plan. You need those people that are there for you. At all times, those people that can carry you and lift you up when life gets hard. Listen, family, God's plan A was to always, from day one, to get us connected with each other in biblical community. Not only, not only community with one another, but community with him. That's been his plan A. There is no plan B. But you will never experience God's plan A until you burn your plan B. Guess what? God wants you in community. So trust his plan A because it's better than what you have in store for yourself. Perhaps the struggle that you're having with community, perhaps the struggle that you and I are both having in community and finding solid people who we can do life with is because God's not just trying to connect you with people. But he wants to connect you deeply with people. Jesus knew better than anyone else what community was like. The entire time he lived, he was in community with people around him. People lied to him, sold him out, beat him, mocked him, turned from him, didn't believe him, hated him. And the struggle was real for Jesus. But he was always in community with people. 
Check this out, Matthew 26. I, 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 I love this. I love this. Listen to God's word come to life right here as we look at the life of Jesus. Check this out, Matthew 26. We see a lot of this actually played out. We see Judas, a man Jesus did life with, sell him out for silver. We see Jesus tell Peter, one of his closest companions, that he would soon deny him three times. And so after both of these things, when the struggle's real and community seems messy, check this out. Something amazing happens right in the middle of it. The night before Jesus is to be crucified, it says this in verse 36. Jesus went with them. Who is them? Now that's his boys. These are the guys he did life with. These are his disciples. Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter, the one who would soon betray him, and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Y'all, the struggle's real in this moment in time. And we hear Jesus sharing his feelings, emotions, and thoughts, even with the ones who life got messy with. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus wanted to be in community with you and I and us with him so much that he knew it would cost him something. And to him it cost him his life. Community is not easy, y'all. And it will cost you. It will cost you. I'm not talking costly from a financial standpoint, okay? That's not the cost I'm talking about. If you look at your life right now, if you examine your life right now, the things that are of most value are the things that cost the most. I think of my own life. I think of marriage and ministry. Marriage and ministry are by far the most fulfilling, rewarding, incredible things that I've ever had the privilege of being a part of. Marriage. Marriage is incredible. I get to love my life, love my wife well. I get to lead her well. It's fulfilling. Yet simultaneously, the hardest thing I've ever done. As I try daily to die to myself and lead her. Ministry. I would be lying to every single person in this room. If I didn't say there were moments, there have been moments more recently than past that I've just wanted to toss the towel in and call it quits because ministry is hard. I've had conversation after conversation with my wife just saying, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. People let me down. It's hard. It's a struggle. But it's the most rewarding thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm not meant to do either of those on my own. Both of those cost me something. There's so much value to people that are there for you when the struggle is real, people that push you closer to who God is. And life gets painful and life gets hard and community is a struggle and it will cost you. But if it costs you, it's worth it. If it costs you something, it's worth it. The things in life that cost you the most are so worth it in the end. Um, as, I, as, I, as I end this, I just I want to share with you guys, um, God has always wanted to get you and keep you in community with each other, with him. And it's hard and crazy and hurts. But the value of solid community is worth whatever it might cost. We, um, our staff here, our, our, our next gen staff, that's kids, middle school, high school, young adults. We went on a retreat a couple months ago. And I, uh, there was this point during the, during the, the staff retreat where our team, our, our, our 
middle school, high school, and young adult team, we all sat together around this table and we just got to share life and, and, and talk about life and what we were going through and the struggle that, that was happening in life and just building each other up. This retreat was meant to build community amongst all of us. And let me tell you, a couple months before this, my wife and I had walked through our fifth miscarriage, the hardest thing that I've ever had to go through. And so I went into this next gen retreat carrying the weight of all of that. And um, it, got to, it got to me to, to speak, and I remember it as though it was yesterday, and I looked at everyone around that table, and I said this. I said, honestly, quite honestly, I feel like none of y'all have been there for me. I said, when it hurt the most, when I was going through the biggest struggle of my life, when my wife was crying in my arms, I'm trying to deal with this miscarriage at the same time as leading my wife well and desiring a family, none of y'all cared enough to be there. None of you were there. And it was quiet for a minute. And then Caleb, our middle school pastor, who I love so much, grew me more in just a few words than I've ever been grown in my life before as he looked at me and he said this. He said, bro, we've been there. We were there for you. You just shut out the very people that could speak life into you. I get chills thinking about this because that's exactly what I did. I went into protection mode. I don't want to get hurt by people again, so I thought the best thing for my wife and I was for me to not go through that part of my life with anyone else. Don't shut out. very people that can build you up simply because you think you're good on your own don't believe the lie that you're okay by yourself don't believe the lie that community shouldn't involve struggle if it doesn't cost you it isn't worth it we just have to understand that many times the things that cost the most only cost the most because they're the most valuable and y'all, that's us. You guys are so valuable to a loving Father. You're so valuable to God. You're so valuable. He just wants us to do life together, try and figure this mess out on earth together because community matters. So let's do it together. If this is your first time here, then let's do this together. If you've been here before and you've heard me say this, let's do life together. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I'm intentional. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do life together. It's going to cost. We're going to let each other down. But man, when people understand and see a biblical, solid community of young adults who are messed up trying to figure life out, when people see that on the outside, guess what? They see that, and they see Jesus magnified through you. And so here's what I want to do, um, action steps for us to take. We're going to launch small groups within the next couple weeks. But instead of me saying, we've got 10 small groups ready for you guys to get plugged into, here's what I want to do. I'm going to have a QR code on the screen right now, and I want you to do this. If you're interested in going deeper, if you're interested in doing life with people, if you're interested in, in, in getting into a small group that will build you and connect you, the very people that you're sitting around right now could be some of your best friends as you grow together, figuring out life. If you're interested, even in the slightest, just follow that QR code, fill out the information, and we will reach out to you this next week, and we'll get you plugged into something that you, I promise you, will grow you and build you. It's going to cost, but it's worth it. Look, I love every single person in this room, and I'm glad you're here. If I have never met you, do me a favor. Please come say hi afterwards. I'm not scary. I won't bite. I want to say hi. I want to get connected. Our team wants to get connected with you. So don't leave here without saying what's up. We want to get plugged in. We want to do life together. So let's do it. God, we trust you. Um, man, God, you're good. You are, you are good. And God, I pray that from this, God, I pray that from tonight, friendships form that are lifelong. God, I pray, I pray that from tonight, 
people are involved and get connected into small groups, into biblical, deep-rooted community where it's going to be hard and it's going to get messy and there's going to be struggle. But God, I pray that we do it together because we're so much stronger together than we are apart. And your son knew that so well. Enough to die for us to get to know him, get connected to him, and get connected to each other. Lord, we love you. We trust you. You are the king of kings. Would you speak to us?